Um, okay, I guess you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, hello everybody. So as, as, as the title um, that, that's uh, hard to read says, I'm gonna be talking, I'm gonna be telling you all a tale of supersymmetry, specifically about the dark magic of integral systems. So I guess let's get into it. So our story starts in up here in, in, the, in the deep dark, uh, in the deep dark forest of Gage Fury Grove. <laughs> and we'll start with meeting a bit of a cult of symmetry because we see there's a bit of a communion going on. We see these QF, the, these quantum field theorists are going through <laughs> a nightly ritual. They're trying to build a theory. So <laughs> what are the ingredients of the theory? What are they going to throw into the pot? Well, first off, they're going to need a substrate. What's the theory going to be on? Well, first, they need a manifold, dimension of four. So this is what this is their space time. This is what this is what it's going to live on. And then they're going to try a bundle of vectors, a vector bundle, rank of two. You see here. So this is the background, but okay, that that's just like a, a sort of topological information. It's not really anything real. What, what, what is, is the, the rank actual, of a what does the rank of a vector bundle mean? The rank of the vector bundle is the dimension of the fiber. So at every point, the fiber is okay. a two-dimensional vector space. I see. Complex vector space. So um now we're going to add in a, a field to the sphere. We're going to add some, some interesting stuff. And that field is going to take the form of a connection. Essentially, um, if we, it's a way of attaching each of the fibers of the vector bundle together, essentially defining a derivative. And it's this connection that's going to act as the fields of the theory. And the way that they actually get any quantum, quantum stuff out of it is by taking this information and assigning it a number. It's called the action. So it's going to depend on the, the field that they chose, the connection. Specifically, it's going to be using the curvature of the connection, which measures how much the connection changes if you move around in a little loop. So the main aspect of it, of the action, is this, this total square curvature part, where you just take essentially the, um, you know, the norm of the curvature according to some, some metric that you attach to um, the, the manifold. And the vector and the vector bundle. So, in differential form language, you can think of the curvature, the connect, the curvature of the connection as a as a two form um, valued in two by two Hermitian matrices, basically, because it's a you know it's on a vector bundle. So, you know, just wedge the two form with its with its Hodge dual, and you integrate that, and that's the that's the norm curvature. So that's one part of it, and then we're also going to add in a little Elliot. topological flavor. Mm -hmm. Elliot. What's your motivation yes. for choosing Hermitian matrices rather than? Um, uh, wider than um, I, it's it's uh, SU SU two with the Lie algebra. Is what okay. I mean. Okay. Algebra value so, one form. Right. Two okay. Form. Yeah. So I guess I guess there should be a trace here because you need to turn this. This is a this is in the Lie algebra because it's a, a Lie algebra thing, and we're taking the trace to turn it into a number because we need to give it a number. So we can also do a topological thing to it where we don't take the Hodge dual, we just wedge it with itself. And this just measures the, it measures the topological quantity of the vector bundle, essentially just its total, its, its degree is what, is what people call it. But all the interesting physics is in this part because you know, um, like if I just change my connection a little bit, it does not change the topological part of the, the action. So this is where the real the real star of the show, and from this we get what's called Yin Mills theory. In the action, and the minus trace actually, but minus trace. Thank you. Uh, so we get Yin Mills theory, um, which I mean. So right now, I mean, they don't really need to be meeting in the middle of the woods at night because they're not doing anything particularly, um, you know, against the law here. This is pretty pretty normal stuff. In fact, our universe, the universe we live in, runs on a yang mill sphere, just like this. In fact, this SU2, it has an SU2 factor too, um, you know, this type of, this bundle of ring two, that describes the weak force. Essentially these fields, these connections propagating throughout the space time, um, this, um, you know, quantizes into the carriers of the weak force. So yang mill sphere, and then we can, we can, we can, like we have, we have um, these parameters that control the strength of the two parts of the action. We can combine them all into a single parameter 
called like the coupling constant. And this is going to be, um, you know, this sort of characterizes how, how, I guess, how strong the action is. So now why were they in the woods? Well, you see these, they got a little bit too greedy and they, they flew too close to sun, I guess they could say, because they didn't just want, they're, they're sort of, they're physicists. They really like symmetry. They're a cult of symmetry. So they tried to go for super symmetry. They wanted to add, you know, they, they're adding all of these fields, all of these bosonic fields, the fields described by these connections, they're adding anti-commuting partners. They're adding fermions. And not only, they don't just add a single supersymmetry. Here's the thing, they add two of them. And okay, so they, so they throw it in the pot, it mixes around a little bit, it boils up a bit, but it starts to come down. But then suddenly, oh my gosh, it goes everywhere. There's, there's, this, there's this, this, this explosion of this, <laughs> Um, you know, all of this, all of this structure is too much symmetry, too much structure. It just gets, it starts flying off and it, it get, it, it's like opening Pandora's box. They evoked the dark magic of integrable systems. So now suddenly all across the land, there's this integrable system sort of magic that's going on because they, they tried to do too much symmetry. And even worse, when they look back into their pot afterwards, there's, their theory was nowhere to be found. So here we have, we have to follow them on their quest to essentially, you know, retrieve the theory and figure out what the dark magic integrable systems have been doing to what, what it did, what structures it added. Why is it so dark? Why is the magic so dark? So that's our, that's our, that's our framing device. Um, yeah, the theory, we need to find the theory. We have to find it. So to, to, to start looking, we need a bit of a clue, like somewhere to, to start our search. And we can get that by sort of thinking a little bit harder about what supersymmetry is, and maybe using essentially, an, 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 we use an analogy, right? Something that'd be a little bit more familiar to, to the geometry people. Where we can think of these fields, let's just analogize them to differential forms. Well, what's the point of that? The point is that we can take the wedge product of forms. And then we have this notion of commuting and anti-commuting, which it corresponds to bosons and fermions. Um, in particular, if you take the wedge product of two even forms, even dimensional differential forms, they always commute with one another. So those are like the bosons, while the odd forms, they anti-commute, they're like the fermions. So a supersymmetry generator is, a, is an operator that takes bosons to fermions. It takes even forms to odd forms and vice versa. And in fact, from geometry, we have a really nice one already in hand. It's called the exterior derivative. It just raises the rank of the form by one. So this is sort of our analog of n equal one supersymmetry, just the algebra where the fields are differential forms and your, your supersymmetry generator is the exterior derivative. So we can kind of think about this as evoking Ramanian geometry um, because you, Ramanian in particular, because you know to actually I guess I'm being a little bit imprecise about this because what I'm saying is a very loose analogy. It can be made precise in some specific circumstances. And in those circumstances where it's made precise, it uses Ramanian geometry. So that's sort of why I'm evoking it. Um, but to push it a little bit further, notice that we, if we invoke, if we add onto our manifold, not just a Ramanian structure, but a complex structure, then we can split up our exterior derivative into two parts. We have the holomorphic part, the del operator, and the anti-holomorphic part, the del bar operator. Now these two things are both um, symmetry generators that send even forms to odd forms, but they're different. And in fact, they have um, they satisfy these commutation relations. Uh, let's see if I can get this right. Equals like one, something like that. Um, that the, the, that's one of the Kähler identities. But basically they satisfy, they form an algebra, the same algebra that they want the supersymmetry generators to satisfy. So we can think of these two guys as creating n equal two supersymmetry where every boson has two um, you know, friendly pairs, right? So for example, they'll, they'll and it also, it also gives you like this nice bi grading of, of our fields in terms of you know, how many, how many dells it takes to get there, how many del bars. But the point of all this is now we move from Ramanian geometry, we added a complex structure and we get what's called Kähler geometry. 
Hold so on. in particular, can, can you explain a little more about the this anti commutation relation? Like, if I just thinking about in terms of what they map to, does this mm -hmm. mean there's like a copy of omega p comma q inside of omega p plus one q plus one or something like that? Um. Should actually, so no, no. oh, I should be there. Should be a dual here. I think. Oh, am I doing this right? Um. You're right. I think I got this wrong. Um. So there's actually four of them because there's these two guys, but then there's also their adjoints. Okay. Um, so there, there's, there's two series of new generators and their adjoints, but basically these, these guys um, together, they have um, vaguely stated, because I don't know the right statement, they have the right, um, they have the correct algebra. They have the algebra you want um, because of some facts about Kähler geometry. Let's just leave it at that. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't think I can derive it on the fly. So the point of this was just, I guess, I think it's this is helpful because it gives a little bit of a set. Like you know, I've, I've had this issue before where people talk about like n equal one, n equal two, n equal four, and I have no idea like why I should care about those numbers or what those numbers mean. But there's sort of this analogy where n equal one is like Riemannian geometry, n equal two is like Kähler. And n equal four is like the higher version of Kähler. But this actually gives us a hint of where we can, since we're using n equal to geometry, we can sort of see where these extra structures came up um, and what sort of extra structures it adds to the system because we have our metric structure and our complex structure. But Kähler geometry, it forms this sort of, I call it the Kähler triangle, this little triforce here. And you can combine the metric and the complex structure to form a symplectic <laughs> structure. And it's the third, the third leg of the triangle. And the symplectic structure is, is interesting because this is actually the structure underlying classical mechanics. And there is our breadcrumb. That is where our QFTists are gonna go searching. They're gonna look for classical mechanics and see what structures arise in there and try to find the dark magic of integrable systems there. So we move on to chapter two, sort of a more fishy situation. Can I just, uh, can I just stop you a second? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanna, Ask Tristan if this is a correct interpretation. Could you go back one page? So, um, just to to sort of say what you're you're trying to say here about the n equal two and and Kähler. So the point is is that now on on this direct sum of the cohomology spaces, now you've split it, in, or the the form spaces, you split it into p and q's. Okay. Right. And the difference with Kähler now is that you have an action of a Lie algebra of SL2, because you've got the left Schutz operator and its dual that act now on those spaces and commute with um, the D operator. Uh, whereas before in the n equal one case, you just had sort of the Lie algebra of U1 acting. Um, so it seems to me like that's what you're trying to say here. Um, um, so the thing I was referencing um, specifically was, was there's this paper by Hitchin um, that deals with hyperkähler geometry and it, it sort of spells this out in detail. But uh, essentially in a, in a sigma model where your fields are maps into some manifold, right. then adding supersymmetry to the manifold means that the, um, the, as far as I understand it, the supersymmetry operators when carried over to that manifold, give it, they act as either the exterior derivative or as, um, you know, these del and del bar operators, I guess that's in the case of like a topological field theory, mm -hmm. like after you twist it or something. Right. Um, so that's what I was saying, but I think what you're suggesting with the SL2R is that like, when you add supersymmetry, you have these like, it's like an R symmetry, something like that. Exactly. Um, where yeah. does this extra symmetry acting on stuff? And yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about it to say anything more competent. Unless Tristan has something to add. I don't know how many physicists there are in the audience other than uh, Mike, I think, but um, the direct mapping that um, Elliot was referring to here is just suppose you have some bunch of bosons and you happen to have two kinds of fermions and their conjugates. So psi one, psi two, psi bar one, psi bar two. And so then those psi one, psi two, psi bar one, psi bar two would be the analogs of D uh, the differential, uh, D of X, D of X bar, 
and then these partial derivatives that you see these del operators they're the conjugate operators derivatives with respect to them so the supersymmetries here in that direct physics representation would just be um partial derivatives by the fields or mathematicians i think would like to call them as vector fields and just because you had two fermions to start with two real fermions you can make complex combinations with them then you have this picture here the omega pq okay thank you i didn't i i don't know this story very well at all so i i was just trying to use this as like a very like to try to get some modicum of um intuition about and by the way the, there is another um reference much older in general this reference or analogy between forms and bosons versus fermions um comes to mind jeffrey rabin and some other folks who were working on the understanding of what supersymmetry ought to mean indeed they were trying to uh even define something like there as an integration over anti-commuting variables in terms of integration over one forms so there is a relatively precise one-to-one -one mapping that you have on the left hand side here in this little book that you are drawing okay thank you you for the input uh there's a question in the chat about the left shits operator so that um system that have by degree one one yeah yeah it'd have to be even yeah yeah. 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 Okay. So now, now we're basically we're gonna we're gonna follow our QFT theorists, or the QFTists down south as they go into classical mechanics. Um, and I I want to take the opportunity because it's the first day to kind of give a little bit more gen um, overview of Hamiltonian mechanics, which is a whole lot less um. Um, highbrow than what we were just talking about, but let's just, let's let's talk. Let's give it a shot. Okay, so what is Hamiltonian mechanics? Um, essentially, we have a couple ingredients. We have a phase space. So in this case, we're going to think of it as a as a Kähler manifold. Um, so that's our M, and then what we it's basically a phase space. Hamiltonian mechanics is is a rule that assigns it to a function a Hamiltonian on that phase space. It gives it a Hamiltonian vector field. It, get, it tells you how your system will evolve it, um, accord, under that Hamiltonian. Now, in particular, this Hamiltonian has to, well, it has to preserve energy. It has to, um, you know, cons um, my Hamiltonian vector field acts on itself. It has to be zero. In other words, it has to lie on a level set somehow, which gives a challenge of how do we actually, you know, canonically define a single, um, vector on the level set that's what the phase space structure does so for example with the with the Ramanian structure we can always take the gradient right so that's normal to the thing but then we need a way to rotate it in 90 degrees and that's where the complex structure comes in basically we just we just multiply by i right because multiplying by i it, it like rotates one to i right that's a 90 degree rotation that does what we want um, more formally, you can think of this complex structure as, uh, as an endomorphism of the tangent bundle that squares to negative one. So it, it's like a matrix sort of analog of I. So okay, let's, let's, let's talk about an example. Um, one dimensional dynamics. So just a particle on a line, right? Um, and then it's phase space. It has the position coordinate. Here, it also has a momentum coordinate. So it's, a, it's R2. But in this case, we can get the phase space structure by considering it as just a complex plane C, because that's a Kähler manifold. And then, um, so let's try to take a given Hamiltonian function, say just, let's look at the Hamiltonian P, just a moment, just that coordinate, right? So it's gradient, it just points straight up. And by the complex structure, we rotate it by 90 degrees, um, oops. rotate it by 90 degrees, um, 
in the wrong direction. Whoops. But um, you might have to use a negative sign here somewhere. But rotated by 90 degrees so that our, our Hamiltonian vector field is just a straight line moving along a constant momentum, which makes sense, right? Because if, um, if I have something with the fixed momentum, I want its flow to be translation. That's what we mean when we say momentum is a generator of translation. So constant momentum, you move constantly in the in X direction. This brings us nicely into a sort of, you know, the, the nice part about Hamiltonian mechanics is all of their symmetries. So what do I mean by a symmetry? I mean a vector field, sort of an infinitesimal symmetry. And it has to do a couple of things if you wanted to preserve, you know, be a symmetry. First off, it has to preserve the Hamiltonian. That's pretty self-explanatory. So just uh, the vector field acting on the Hamiltonian is going to be zero. But also, you needed to preserve the phase space structure. Um, and it turns out that that's essentially equivalent to it being a Hamiltonian vector field in and of itself. So essentially, it you know our symmetry has to come from some Hamiltonian. In this case, I wrote it as H prime that generates the symmetry. Like over here, our symmetry of translation was generated by our symmetry of translation was generated by the momentum coordinate. So what can we do with this? Let's just see. Um, what do I want to use? Okay. So by definition of symmetry, I, I know that um, the Hamiltonian vector field acting on H it has to be zero. And by just manipulating this a little bit, just a really a little quick little thing, we can get um, something that's honestly pretty significant, pretty deep. So let's just um, take our formulas, right? So what does it mean um, to do this? Well, what we're basically saying is we're taking the um, by looking at how the Hamiltonian changes under the flow of this other Hamilton of the Hamiltonian H prime, we're taking, we can take the dot product of the gradient of H and the other vector field. Now, the thing is J was an endomorphism and J has the property that it is, I guess, her mission, skew orthogonal. That's maybe that's a better word for it. But basically, um, if we look at the matrix form of J, it looks kind of like this. So, what that means is we can carry it over to the other side with a negative sign. And then we can use our sort of our definition again of the Hamiltonian vector field and see that, you know, the um, evolution of the Hamiltonian H under H prime is negative of the evolution of H prime under H. And since the first is a symmetry, so is the second. In other words, H prime is conserved. Every symmetry has a conserved quantity. So that's like Murray theorem. That's kind of cool. Now, the the really interesting thing about this, um, in for for our purposes, is that it means that every symmetry kind of acts twice. Because there's the first. Let's say that H H prime is a symmetry, and let's just try to like reduce the dynamics as much as we can. Well, first off, we know that um, it's going to be constant. H prime is going to be constant. So we might as well just like restrict to a level set um, uh, where H itself is constant. Right, so that reduces the dimension by one. That's kind of what you'd expect when you impose a symmetry. But moreover, let's look at the, the sort of vector fields of H prime. Now, this fact up here essentially means that if you look at the inner product of the flow of our Hamiltonian with the flow of our, you know, of our symmetries Hamiltonian, it's gonna be constant as well. Which means essentially that you're gonna keep, if you start going in a certain, like a, a certain speed in a given, you know, in your H prime direction, you're gonna keep going at that speed. It's gonna be predictable, right? So for instance, over here, here's our example. Like, even though we only can like for sure restrict to the H prime equal constant level, oops, we can only for sure restrict to this H prime equal constant, we can only reduce dimension by one, but that still means that the, um, the flow in this other direction, in this, in the Hamiltonian vector field generated by H prime in that direction, that's gonna be predictable. It's gonna be fixed, right? So a good example over here is that that's saying, for example, if I have a three-dimensional Hamiltonian, I don't know, let's say it's preserved under, um, it's, it's um, symmetric under X translations, right? So that means that it's X momentum, X component of its momentum is conserved. That means two things. One, you lie on X momentum is constant on that level set, but also it means that your X velocity is gonna be constant, right? So you, you, get, you get twice, you get two for one. 
So this like uh, if for if you if you're, um for stuff like uh, what's it called moment uh, symplectic reduction, it like uses this 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 property to to reduce it reduces things like twice as much as you'd expect. It's kind of weird. Okay, so now our 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 merry band of two of tears, they're they're going down and they 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 come to the town of Louisville. And in the center of Louisville, they see this very weird structure. It's this gigantic series of nested tori. And on the tori are a bunch of a bunch of little fish in this case. They're just going around in a constant direction. They're flowing around. And this is a this is a very curious sort of phenomenon that happens. So they ask one of the, the nice little fish who are you know, going over to the tori. They ask one of them, okay, what's going on here? What's the story of Louisville? And the fish is very proud to. Uh, report that Louisville just has it's the best symmetry it's the most symmetric it's a it's a very symmetric town they're very happy about it and that causes this phenomenon called Louisville integrability where essentially we have as much symmetry as we can shove into the system so remember how I said that um, it counts double so if we have a 2n dimensional phase space then that means that we can only actually put in n symmetries, right? And so we have these n's, let's take, let's call it h1 for h, and these are our symmetries. And we actually need these symmetries to, you know, be symmetries with, like, with respect to each other too, be kind of awkward if they weren't. So we need to make the extra condition that um, they preserve each other. If you flow along one of them, you're gonna preserve the other, right? So that's what is called a Poisson commuting, a set of maximum of Poisson commuting variables. That's what this is called. So let's try to like apply what we learned, right? So first off, um, well, we know that the Hamiltonian is preserved under the flows of all these symmetries, which means that the Hamiltonian vector field has to live on a level set, a level set of all of these guys at once, which is going to be an n-dimensional manifold, right? Let's call that, let's call that L. So for example, in here, um, one, of these one of these tori, this would be an L. Right, it's preserved under the Hamiltonian flow is this, this fish flow, and it, it stays on one of these tori. Now, the other thing is that we actually, we can use the other constraint we have. And these Hamiltonian vector fields actually, because there's n of them and it's an n-dimensional manifold, it spans the tangent space at every point. So if we know how the Hamiltonian vector field, like, um, it, how, how it's, its value along each of these basis vector fields, and we know that those are all constant, that totally fixes the Hamiltonian, right? So just from its single initial condition, we know that um, we know both which torus it's on and what its flow is going to do for all of time. That's why it's called integrability. We can so-called integrate this, um, this, integrate this dynamical system really easily. It's very predictable. Um, as an example, let's consider our free and let's take free symmetries. Let's say that the X momentum, Y momentum, and Z momentum are all conserved. Momentum is totally conserved. So first off, you know you're gonna stay at the same momentum at all time, but also you know that your velocity has to be constant, right, in your, in your position. So your flow is totally predictable. You literally just move in a straight line. So same thing happens here, although it might, it might wrap on itself a little bit. Basically, um, what we can conclude from this information is we can take these vector fields as the basis of a Lie algebra. And the sort of manifold, this L that they trace out um, is gonna be a Lie group. So with this Lie algebra, and this Lie algebra, this here says that the Lie algebra is abelian, which means the Lie group is abelian. And that tells you, you know, that tells you pretty much very closely what it is. It's just going to be a torus across some Euclidean space. And um, you know, this condition here means that our flow on this lead group is going to be just an exponential map. It's going to be linear. It's going to be straight. It's going to be exactly what you'd expect. Um, now, if we can make a compactness argument, as we often can, like saying, oh, look, the energy level set is compact, is often the case, then we know that it can't be Euclidean. So that just means it's a torus. It has to be um, some factors if you want, right? So this is the sort of idea with it, is we get from this integral system structure, from these maximal symmetries, we're gonna get a bunch of tori. 
And in fact, we can say a little bit more about these because, um, well, let's actually use this inflected form that I talked, that I said we we're going to use. Um, that's what I was doing here by combining the metric and the complex structure in this way, you get the symplectic form. Um, now this, this, this statement that all of their flows commute, all of these basis um, vector fields commute, that translates into saying that if we restrict this symplectic form to the torus, it has to totally vanish. So your dynamics on the torus itself from the induced symplectic form are going to be trivial. And that's what's called a Lagrangian, a Lagrangian submanifold. And these are very, very popular things in symplectic geometry. So essentially, integrable systems give us a bunch of these Lagrangian tori. And in fact, it means that we can phrase our phase space, our whole phase space, since every point of phase space lives on one of these tori, it's going to be a vibration, a Lagrangian torus vibration. So for example, here, like we have, um, yeah, a bunch of these nested tori amongst each other. And we can sort of like look at the radius amongst this from the central torus as we go out. And that sort of parameterizes the different tori. So we get our base, which is like this, this half line here. And then we have a bunch of um, tori over the base. So the base is parameterized by the possible values of our symmetry Hamiltonians, our n symmetry Hamiltonians. And then the fibers are just going to be the level sets where those are all constant. So that gives us our tori. Now, in particular, it's, it's more interesting than just like the space cross a torus because you get the generations at given points. Like this example here, the central plate, um, central torus, as it gets smaller and smaller, it's going to eventually turn into just a circle, right? So it, it degenerates from, I guess, T2 into T1 as you, as you hit this point. So that's essentially the classical structure of phase space. By looking at these maximally symmetric systems, you get Lagrangian torus vibrations that, that will probably degenerate somewhere. Okay. So move on to, to chapter three. So, you know, after after learning about the, the Louis Billions and um, you know, their, their their ways and their cultures, they asked, okay, have you seen this this field theory? This one that escaped us and kind of, you know. We, we can't find it, we're looking for it. And they, they suggested, oh yeah, okay, just, just go to the east through the mountains and look inside Soliton Swamp. So this is gonna be the next stop on our journey. In particular, so they, they walk into Soliton Swamp and like, it, it's a very, like, it's, it's a wet place. You know, there's lots of shallow water waves going on, um, that sort of thing. But <laughs> they see a very strange sight, a line of frogs and the frogs all have their tongues attached to the one in front of them. And these frogs are kind of hopping along. Like, what's the deal with that? It's like, it's like a toad lattice, a, to a toad lattice maybe. So, so these frogs have this very peculiar property with their tongues where the, the force that it takes that they retract their tongues with um, depends on you know, how long they're stretched out. And in particular, is uh, it goes exponentially, exponentially decays the longer their tongue goes out. So this ends up giving like the, this this frog in the center, for example, that this force is pulling from this side and from this side, and it gives uh, interesting dynamics as when the frogs you know jump around and that sort of thing. So let's consider say n toads in a line all stuck together like this. So we have a Hamiltonian describing them. It has. Um, you know, if this kinetic energy term does what you'd expect, and then you have the potential term when you add up all of the distances from each frog to its neighbors, and it's a it's a very no, it's a very nonlinear Hamiltonian. It doesn't you don't expect to see nice like wave super nice wave properties because again it's exponential it's nonlinear. But the interesting thing is, I mean, it's it's called soliton swamp for a reason because these have so called soliton solutions. For example. Um, the QFTers, they notice that in this one chain of frogs, um, there's, there were these two hopping, like they were hopping over and there's these waves propagating down the thing. And two of them were about to hit each other. And they thought, oh, okay, it's nonlinear. They're gonna do something weird, it'll, it'll destruct it. But as they went through each other, they crossed and then they passed each other without even seemingly interacting at all. Again, I want to emphasize that's expected for linear waves. That's just superposition. But for nonlinear waves, this is not what you'd expect. 
And these are called, these are called solitons. These are basically self-propagating waves that keep the same amplitude and, and configuration in space over time. And they're useful because, oh man. Just a second, I'm sorry. Charging. Okay, they're useful because you can actually, the interesting thing about the system is you can split it entirely into sums of solitons. You can decompose any wave run into just a bunch of these different solitons. And then since these solitons, they just move at a constant speed and they don't interact with each other, it's very easy to see what you get, right? It's very predictable. And in fact, what you get here is an integrable system, huh? a completely integrable system, just like the ones we saw in classical mechanics land. Um, yeah, so we have these, what are the conserved quantities? What are the, the things that are conserved, the symmetries? Uh, well, those are just essentially the amount of, I don't know, the, let's, let's if we if we label each soliton, the amount of that amount of soliton, because that's not going to change because the solitons don't interact with each other, right? So, you know, we have a bunch of symmetries for all the different types of solitons, and this turns our thing into the structure of a completely integrable system. Now, how do we understand the system a little bit better? Well, we can use um, this tool called the lax pair. If we just sort of rewrite it in a clever way, then we can see exactly what these solitons are, just falling right out. So let's um, form it as this equation. Let's say we can, let's suppose that we can rewrite the equations as something like this, where A and L are matrices. Right, where we're saying the time derivative of our L matrix is, a, is our time derivative is a commutator with itself, with, with L, some A. I don't know what A is, just some A. As long as we can find some A that this is true. And this is interesting because, you know, the commutator is like an infinitesimal version of conjugation, right? Um, this, if this is in the Lie algebra in the Lie group of matrices, it's conjugation. So when we integrate this, um, it means that we just have our L of T, you know, for some matrix L, the matrix L that sort of describes our system is just going to be a conjugation by a unitary matrix, which is going to be just the exponential of A. And in particular, you know, conjugation, it doesn't change the eigenvalues. So the spectrum under a flow of this sort of equation of motion, the spectrum is going to be constant. And that's kind of cool because, you know, if this is an N by N matrix, that's already N conserved quantities, right? This, there's a whole lot of consult, conserved quantities there. And in particular, we also know how the rest of the evolution works. It's very predictable. It's pretty much linear on this Lie group. So the eigenvalues are conserved quantities in this case, but it's the eigenvectors that are, one, that are the ones that are changing. And these sort of act like the angles of, of our torus. Um, yeah, so let's do, let's do an example. In particular, they noticed that there was this one particular, there were just two frogs. They were latched onto each other, only two of them, but it was like periodic, right? And they were hopping along and they, they just like all of the other frogs, but this one, they could, they could see that, okay, this, these frogs, these came from the, 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 their theory, their lost theory, somehow, I don't know, I don't know how, how did they get into frogs, but like they could see the dark, the, the, the dark magic all over it, I guess. So let, let's look at this example. And this is a good example because we can actually write down what these matrices are. And even better, we can't just write, we don't just need to write down one matrix, we can write down a whole one parameter family of matrices um, that describe, you know, how that all obey this equation and all give you the, the first equations of motion. So the actual form isn't too important. Like there's, there's momentum here and then there's this, this essentially the stuff that comes from the potential on the off diagonals. Um, I just wanted to write it just so you, you could see that I wasn't like lying. You know, like I wrote something down and said, I'm not making it up. Um, but the important part is that, you know, we have a whole family of these guys. So then what are the solitons? Well, if we look at the eigenvectors, those kind of act like the solitons. The eigenvectors describe the sort of amplitudes or positions of the two frogs relative to each other. And these evolve over time. Um, you know, so their evolution 
of these solitons is described by you know just this exponentiation, but on the level of these 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 frogs, the solitons just move around in a circle, right? At a constant speed, um, they just kind of loop around. And in particular, so what is this? It's a linear flow on on on, on the circle, and there's two solitons, so there's two components of the flow. So it's a linear flow around uh, the circle squared, around the torus. That doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> so and basically, we can see here in this in this nice little total lattice, these total lattices. Um, yeah, like in this case, look, we do indeed we get something that's very similar to these integral systems we were talking about before. So they talked to, let's see, yeah, oops. They talked to the frogs and they asked the frogs, okay, so you have, you came from the field theory. Where did it go? We need to find it. And the frogs, their frogs are very cryptic. And they, they just said that you know, what you're looking for is East, look inside the spectral cemetery. So, you know, they went in. And it's a very curious place. It's very, very spooky, lots of fog everywhere. And it seemed like there, it's like a it's like a ream on surface graveyard, right? Like I mean, there's like a torus over here or something, but like they came across this in particular, this copy of CP1, CP1 shaped tombstone. But as I went closer, ah, it jumped out at them. Look, it's a what is that? It's 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 a spectral curve. So they asked the spectral, I mean, they started talking about the spectral curve. It's a little kind of nonplussed to them. They're waking it up from its nap, but you know, it was, it was happy to answer. Um, see, the spectral curve, they claimed that it contained the soul of those frogs over there. In fact, all of this whole this whole place, it contained this whole graveyard, it contained spectral curves. And, holds the souls of all of these integral systems. So what is it even? Well, basically it comes from this, this one parameter family of matrices that we just made from that lack system, this, this L of Z. And we can split this matrix into its eigenvalues, this lambda and its eigenvectors. But in particular, these are now functions of Z. And in fact, they're holomorphic. Holomorphic functions of Z. So it's a multi-value function because in this case it was two by two. So we get two eigenvalues for each point. So let's just sort of graph them, right? At every point we look at the C, we graph its eigenvalues. And what it does is it traces out a surface, right? In this case here, we can see, for example, it crosses over here, but like this the set of lambdas over each of these, it traces out a surface. And if we include the infinity point, then we can get it over CP1. And once again, you know, we get, that's what this is. This is the spectral curve. It's the trace of the eigenvalues of the total lattice, the two by two total lattice of last time. But importantly, we can also use the eigenvectors in this language, you know, in the same story. Because the eigenvectors, um, they give a vector to each point on, on this curve, right? Because every, every, every eigenvalue has an associated eigenvector. And these vectors, they sort of glue together into a line bundle. So not only do we get from this um, polynomial matrix, essentially, we get a spectral curve over CP1, and we also get a line bundle over the curve. But remember, um, sorry. Yeah. OK, so let's, let's talk about the two total lattice again. So the two by two matrix. And in particular, what are its eigenvalues? Um, well, we can just solve the characteristic equation, right? The, the characteristic polynomial. Take the determinant and set it to zero, and we can rearrange that, and we get a quadratic um, quadratic thing because it's two by two. So lambda squared equals some polynomial in C. So this means that the the, the curve we get is going to be it's what's called a hyperelliptic curve. The characterizes character hyperelliptic curves. Now, this Toda case, in particular, this f of z is going to be a cubic. Um, I don't know. Let, let's just call them, let's say the roots are 0, lambda, and negative lambda. So these um, lambda and negative lambda sort of control. It's a, it's a complex parameter, controls where the roots are, but it you know, controls which curve it is. 
So we can see here, for instance, on our spectral curve from last time, we can look at all the different branch points. There's this one at infinity. You can see it crosses over. There's one at lambda and one at zero at the bottom and back in the back where we can't really see it. There's another one at negative lambda. So four, four branch points. In particular, that means it's going to be a torus from the sort of formula relating um, you know, branch points for hyperelliptic curves in their genus. So the spectral curve of our total lattice is, is, is going to be a torus. And in particular, as we evolve the, um, as we evolve our system, remember the whole point was that the eigenvalues of that, of that matrix were constant under evolution. And this spectral curve is just a trace of eigenvalues. It's going to be conserved, right? The curve itself is going to be conserved. Um, but what isn't conserved is the, the fiber for this integral system, the, the level set of all of the things which have the same eigenvalues, but different eigenvectors. And those eigenvectors, again, those eigenvectors vary holomorphically, they define a line bundle. And in particular, the fiber is going to be the space of all line bundles on our curve. So that's called the Jacobian. Oh boy, it's a big word. Um, and in particular, like that's not that hard to understand. It's just a, it's, it's a torus, right? Essentially every line bundle you get is by choosing some sort of phase around, around a basis of loops in your, in your, in your um, Riemann surface. We choose the amount of phase that you gain as you travel around that loop. And the line bundle of, okay, well, if in this genus, in a genus G case, there's going to be two G loops, right? The first homology is going to be Z to the two G. There's two G loops and we just assign a phase to each one. Um, so it's U to the two G, right? It's a torus. So that gives us a, a really nice picture, right? Where we can sort of, well, let's, for, for instance, we have, we have the base, which sort of characterizes the different spectral curves. In this case, it is actually a, um, it's gonna be a vector space because, well, it's just defined by, in this case, 2G minus one roots, right? I'm subtract it's 2G plus two, and I'm subtracting three because you have a Mobius transform so that gives you three degrees of freedom to take away. Basically, these 2G minus one roots, like the find a thing. So this is like a copy of um, C to the 2G minus one. The way I'm saying it is a little bit redundant. There's, there's more economical ways to do it. But anyway, that's the base of our system. And then we can look at the fibers and the fibers for the most part, whenever the curve that is defined is going to be regular, it's going to be like a nice smooth beam on surface. Whenever that happens, the fiber is just going to be the Jacobian here, right? And the flow on the Jacobian is just, it's a, it's a torus, it's, going to, it's an integrable system. The flow is linear. So that gives us essentially our, our picture of this integral system. It lives on this Lagrange, the phase space turns into this Lagrangian torus vibration, where the base is spectral curves, the fibers are tori, and the evolution is a straight line along the Jacobian. And again, what happens? I mean, sometimes it's going to be singular, like at this point in the center, for, for instance, where I guess it would be lambda equals zero. So a bunch of the roots coincide at the same place. So the spectral curve is going to be singular. So it's not the Jacobian. Um, it's going to be more complicated. In this case, it's like nice, it's five copies of P1 in this, in this cute little bubble pattern. But that's just a degeneration, right? That's what happens. Um, like, as I said, these integral systems, they generally like to degenerate. The, 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 they aren't just tori everywhere. OK. So. Actually, I think I might be able to finish today if I, okay, one last step. They can finally, they, they asked the spectral curve. Okay, great. I see how you're the, um, the soul of the, of the frogs, but what does that have to do with our theory? We we're trying to find this theory that we lost, but the, the spectral curve very wisely said, no, it's the soul of that theory too. And Okay, to get the answer is it said, okay, you have to go north and you have to climb Seberg Witten Summit. And so they finally arrive, you know, the, the, the our QFT, our QFT, all oh, just, it, it arrives at the, the Seberg Witten Summit, this, this massive edifice of 
what is just covered in Torah everywhere. And, you know, he can tell like, this is the, this is the fury. This is the fury that they lost. Yet somehow it looks nothing like, where did all these Torah come from? Like what happened? Well, what happened was renormalization. Oh boy. Let's go back all the way to back, back to the pot. Let's, let's re-examine what actually happened in the pot that caused all of the stuff to go wrong. Um, it started as an SU2 gauge free, right? This, this, this um, SU2 gauge free, but as it cooled down, it changed. And that process, the process it undergone is what's called renormalization. So um, in more generality, renormalization is sort of this description of how things tend to simplify as you go into more low energies. Take an example of a bathtub. A bathtub, if I want to model a bathtub, that is enormously, horribly, unbearably complicated because you have 10 to the 23rd. 10 to the 23rd is huge, a huge number of quantum um, molecules all interacting with each other. And at high energies, they like, you know, this very like non, like they interact with things far away and all that sort of thing. It's just a mess. You have no hope. But still, you know, you can, you can like model a bathtub in a computer because most of the world does not happen at, at temperatures where these quantum effects matter. No, most of the world happens at a much lower energy scale. And at these lower energy scales, all of these really high energy degrees of freedom, they kind of just average out. They don't matter anymore. And the only thing that ends up mattering is these, these few, this very small set of bulk variables, stuff like the velocity and the viscosity and the pressure and the density. Like that's pretty much it. And with these, these this horribly complicated system here reduces to, a, um, you know, comparatively, it's a really simple differential equation. Navier-Stokes equation. It's not easy to solve, but to write it is simple. So that's sort of the core idea behind renormalization is that when you go into these lower energies, you get this effective description of what's happening. That's, that's not, it's not right. It's not, it's not fully accurate, but for the energies you're talking about, it's really good. Um, and this effective field theory, it tends to be, it's a, it's a lot simpler than your original thing. And the same thing happened to, to, our, to, our, to our field theory. It started out as SU2, but as it cooled down um, through this process called the Higgs mechanism, I don't want to go in, uh, this process called the Higgs mechanism, essentially it ended up becoming a U1 theory, right? The gauge group, it turned from a, a, a rank two vector bundle, two dimensional fibers to one dimensional fibers, one dimensional complex fibers. And that basically what happened is we went from our, our general matrix to something which is diagonalized. And these diagonals, because it's, it has to be unitary, these diagonals are described by just a phase, a U1 factor. So as we went to low energies, um, you know, we have a U1 theory. And this is great because U1 theories are a whole lot easier than SU2. SU2, remember, in the real world, this was weak force. U1 is electromagnetism. Awesome. I know how to do electromagnetism. So what, what do we get? Well, we get a U1 gauge free, right? We get the same sorts of things, the same terms as we got before. Um, we have a curvature term, except now the curvature is just a lot simpler. It's just the exterior derivative of some field, of some one form. That's it. But we get in our interaction, in the, in the number that we're, we're assigning to this, we have this, this square, the square curvature term, and then this topological term. And then a bunch of other stuff for like supersymmetry. Anyway, U1 gauge theory, and again, we have these coupling constants, the stuff that determines the relative strengths of these. Now we can combine them together into a single thing, which we're gonna call tau. Um, you know, we have this, this, this topological part and then this, um, this, this not topological part, but in particular, it depends on this function U. Um, Okay, so if I have about 10 more minutes left in the talk, should I just keep going? Or should I like uh, um, stop earlier and wait till next time or something? I can't hear what you're saying. Um, maybe we should uh, discuss what we're gonna do next. So this actually was a really nice um, 
introduction, but maybe we should go into some more detail about. Uh, yeah, I haven't got. I haven't, cyber, whatever. I haven't quite gotten to the punchline yet, but that'll right. probably take a little bit longer than four minutes, which is why. Um, uh, what do so, people think? I like. I can like me. take the first like ten or fifteen minutes next time, maybe to finish this up. Um. Okay, what do people think here? But do we have anyone for next week? Uh, um, um, both so, Richard and Lucian, I think they are not here, so they were kind of, um, I think, willing to give a talk, but uh, um, none of them are here. Well, well, maybe you should pause here and continue next time for the first 15 minutes and then I'll try to recruit somebody to uh, to continue where you leave off. How about that? Yeah, Dr. Wentworth may be offered. I'm not sure if he actually offered to talk about um, super yang mills. Yeah, so I think that would be good. So maybe, maybe we should pause here and then... Um, Okay. You can continue for 15 minutes next time and then he'll sort of take over after that. Does that sound okay? okay. Yeah. All right. So I guess I guess then I should ask if anybody has any questions for what I talked about this time. Uh, about that uh, torus uh, vibration. So what happens uh, when the, we get the singular fibers? So you were, you were kind of said it, but um, how the singular fibers are treated in um, physically, um, how they affect the... Physically, like in terms of the physics or... Yeah, I mean, how they are treated. I don't know how they so get around. Um, I... I'm trying <laughs> to think of a good answer for this. Um, I mean, in some sense, like this, 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 this picture is a pretty good example um, where the flow goes around both dimensions of the torus. Usually that's what happens. But as you get to the singular fiber, essentially one of those dimensions goes away. Um, and the other one, you just, you just get straight flow around a circle. That's what happens at a singular fiber. So it, in this case, it's sort of a flow around a, um, a torus of a lesser dimension. So maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's an answer. Um, like in terms of the, the, the field theory stuff, which I haven't gotten to yet, the singular fibers um, mean something they do have like implications in terms of the physics that I don't understand, but like I, 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 I gathered that there was stuff going on there and interesting stuff going on there. Um, yeah, did that help? Yeah, sure. I mean, I just wanted to. Hello, do you also have the other extreme? So in one extreme you have the torus becomes infinitesimally thin. So that's the reduction to a lower dimensional torus. Hmm. But if you, extrapolate in the opposite direction, then you get a horn torus. Um, do you mean like we're one of the, okay, like it develops a, a cusp? If you look at my, so a cross section oh. of a, right, it, it ends up the two inside points end up touching. So you have a, a torus mm -hmm. in which two separate points identify, or actually a whole internal circle um, right. shrinks down to a point. Yeah, that's actually what, what happens in, in Sieberg Witten theory. Um, is is you, you get two of those types of singularities showing up. So so with the total lattice thing and the Z, like the fact that there's a one parameter Z thing is like gravy, but not necessary for it to be integrable, right? Um not sure how to answer this correctly because Every integral system has a spectral curve, ish kind of, but basically the idea of spectral curves um, is very closely intertwined with integral systems. That's kind of why I said they're like the soul of the integral system. Um, so somehow you're gonna get a spectral curve out of it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, cause in this case, the way you actually get this one parameter family is, is it's like blocks theorem. Uh, essentially, you look at the, you say uh, it's periodic lattice. So you say if I go from this point to this point, I'm going to gain 
usually you think of it as periodic, like it's they're equal, but in this case, you say, let's multiply it by Z. And that's where you get this one parameter found. So it's not like it came out of, like just pulled it out of a hat. Um, that's sort of where it came from. And I imagine you can do this in a lot of sort of systems, but I guess in general, integrable systems are kind of like, they're like a body of related techniques, but there isn't like a nice um, systematic way of dealing with them. Um, it's kind of like, you know it when you see it. And like, if you can find a, if you can find a lax pair, that's great. But like, if you're just looking at the system you think is integral, there's not necessarily an obvious way to like write down this one parameter family of things, I don't think. Okay. Oh, I did, I did also want to mention, um, if, if people remember my talk from last semester about, about spectral curves, about, sorry, about topological recursion, the sort of thesis of that was that these are recursive invariants you get from a certain spectral curve, and they come up like in all sorts of different places you'd never expect. Um, and, you know, that's the, that's sort of what the dark magic of integral systems is, is because all of those kinds of spectral curves show up, there's probably going to be integrable structures somewhere in there too. And it means that the techniques from integrable systems just pop up like in all of these unexpected places and it kind of feels like dark magic to me. That was, that's why I went with this angle. Okay, well, thanks. That was really, yeah, thank you. That was really very, very cute. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Harry Potter meets integral, integral systems. <laughs> also, if you, if you notice the, the face that I, that yes. I stole from uh, Hitchens' equations. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so okay. See, see people next week. Uh, all right, so I'll stop the recording now. Mm -hmm.